Hi there and welcome. Today is a very special day. It's the 35th anniversary of the IBM PC. And because of that, we're doing a teardown of the IBM PC. Now here we have the IBM PC seen from the top. Of course, there used to be a monitor here. I've moved that away. And uh, there's also the keyboard. And uh, this keyboard is just fantastic. The keys are very noisy, but typing on this keyboard is just heaven. If we look at the front, of the machine. There used to be two floppy drives. Um, this one was a very expensive one. It cost 9,000 US dollars because of an IBM hard drive uh, sitting in this uh, disk bay. Okay, at the back it looks like a modern PC. You have power supply in one corner, uh, air vent for the fan. <coughs> Down here there's one hole for the keyboard. Of course back then there's no mouse or anything. And uh, then we have plug-in slots here at the back. So uh, you can see where modern PCs get their architecture from. It's a 35 year old architecture. Okay, so now we're looking uh, directly down into the IBM PC. And uh, what we have is basically the main board down here, which no one can see. The power supply, a hard drive, a floppy drive and plug-in cards. And uh, you can see the direct descendants of all modern PCs to this initial IBM PC. I'm going to remove all the cards and uh, then we can take a look at the main board hopefully. First of all we have all the way on the right here we have the color graphics adapter and uh, that was the very first video card available for the IBM PC and uh, this card was able to deliver 320 by 240 pixels at uh, something like uh, four colors and uh, it could of course also do text uh, 40 by 25 characters or 80 by 25 characters but you could not mix uh, text and graphics the card itself uses the Hitachi uh, 6845 graphics controller chip and it basically all it does is uh, reading stuff from memory and pumping it out through the video connector here this chip as I said it has uh, either text mode or graphics mode and in text mode the character set is read from this ROM here below that we have the RAM and uh, that is uh, used for graphics mode. And it was possible to change each pixel individually, but only four colors and four very useless colors like pink and brown and cyan and yeah, it just looked awful. It wasn't those useful colors like uh, blue and green and black and, and red. But anyway, that was IBM's first graphics card. And uh, apart from the RAM and the controller chip, it's basically just a lot of TTL gates to generate the correct timing. And uh, also we have down here, don't forget that we have four buffer chips. Because the CPU is not able to drive uh, 8 cards at one time if each card has uh, 4 or 5 TTL gates connected to the bus. So on each board there is a bus distribution kind of thing. So the signal from the CPU goes to these chips and then distributes it out from there. So uh, each, each connector has a load of just one. Anyway you can see there's a special 9 pin connector here for the CGA, the color graphics adapter uh, video and then there's a little one here with composite video if you had a composite color monitor or you had a TV with a video in. Um, next to that we have something a little bit special in that it combines two or three functions on one card and uh, this is the maximizer card because even at this early stage you were running out of slots. This board here as you can see has a lot of RAM and uh, that was because the main board itself on the original IBM PC had between 64K and 256K of RAM. And the machine of course was able to uh, make use of 640K total, which was uh, more memory than anyone would ever use, according to I think Bill Gates. Uh, if we look at the board, apart from the RAM here, we have a 8250, which is a serial port chip. And there are two connectors here for serial port interface. And uh, there's a socket here, and I'm pretty sure that would accept another 8250, making it uh, able to handle uh, two uh, serial ports at once. Uh, apart from that, we have a real-time clock chip here. This is uh, National Semiconductors uh, 58167, and it has a lithium battery. And uh, you would think that the IBM PC itself had a real-time clock, uh, and it did, but it wasn't battery backed up. So that uh, every time you switched off the machine and switched it on again, you had to set the clock manually. And uh, I think a lot of us who remember these days had a batch file that was run during a startup 
that would uh, allow us to key in the time. The remaining stuff is uh, some TCL gates and uh, some line drivers for the serial port. And uh, we have down here another connector, which is a parallel port connector, I think, uh, so that you can hook up a printer. And uh, the parallel port was made with the individual 7.4 LS buffer chips. So a very basic design, but uh, as you can see, if you wanted two serial ports, one printer port, one real-time clock, and some more RAM, you, you would probably uh, use up four or five slots. So combining everything into one uh, would be very nice. But uh, this card here is not made by IBM. This is an aftermarket card by a, a company called Sigma Designs. But anyway, very nice. The next one we have here is the hard disk controller. <coughs> and uh, this actually tells you a little bit about the age of this machine. Because uh, soon after, a few years after, uh, they came out with something on the IBM AT, if I'm not wrong. They come out with something called uh, the IDE interface, which stands for Integrated Drive Electronics. So basically what that meant was all the electronics that is on this card would be on the hard drive itself. So you wouldn't need all this uh, stuff, uh, all this extra electronics. But anyway, uh, these are the early days of the IBM PC. And this board is an original IBM. It's called uh, the IBM 1501. And uh, what we have on this board is uh, very interesting. We have, of course, the connector to the CPU. Then we have some buffer chips because we don't want to load the CPU too much. Um, but then we have something very interesting. We have a chipset called the ZBEX, uh, ZBEX chipset. And I don't have much information about it. Uh, but the ZBEX chipset was driven or run by a Zilog Z80 CPU. So basically on this drive, on this uh, hard disk controller card, there's a CPU with just as much power as the main CPU in the IBM machine. Uh, anyway, then we have a lot of glue logic, we have a lot of uh, TTL gates, a lot of drivers, because the data comes in through this cable at very high speed. Uh, and finally we have some analog stuff here that goes together with the ZTEC, ZBEC, ZBEC chipset. <coughs> and, uh, that is basically a phase log loop circuit uh, because data coming out of the hard disk uh, would not come at a steady state, at a steady rate. It would come in as uh, depending on the speed of the platter and uh, definitely uh, this is not very stable. So we have to extract uh, the clock from the data itself and uh, they would use a phase log loop to, to do that. So uh, yeah, that is basically it for the hard disk controller card. Uh, I'm not going to say more about that. Uh, although, if you see later on, if you're familiar with the Isabus cards that use this card connector, uh, a lot of the cards had a lot of interrupts and a lot of jumpers, so you could configure which card used which interrupt. But back in the early days when the IBM XT just came out, uh, IBM already decided what interrupt used for what card. So it's only when the third party cards came along, it would be necessary to reconfigure interrupts and stuff like that. So um, if you bought an IBM original IBM PC and you bought only IBM uh, original plug-in cards, configuration would be very, very easy. But uh, enough, enough about that. And uh, then we have here the next card. It's the floppy disk controller. And uh, yeah, there's not much to say about that. Um, it's, basically, it's basically using a standard NEC uh, D765 floppy disk controller, so this is nothing new. This chip has been used with a lot of other um, PCs of that era, like the Oric One or uh, the Mimo Tech and other machines like that. The only interesting thing here is that there's an external connector, so you could connect uh, an external floppy disk drive. I never heard of anyone doing that, but uh, it was possible. And uh, then finally, I'll just leave it here. Finally, the last card is a half-length card, and uh, this is uh, using the National 8250 chip, which is a serial port chip. So uh, yeah, there's not much to say here. There's the serial port chip, there's a couple of buffer chips for the bus, and then there is um, the connector, of course. And uh, what else do we have? Uh, we have two chips here, two drivers, uh, 75. 154, which is a plus minus 12 volt drivers for the RS232 uh, 12 volt signaling.
Okay, I now got the main board free, more or less. There is a metal bracket up here where the floppy drive used to sit and uh, I can't get it out and uh, I also cannot get out the main board because of these little plastic clips. But anyway, this is not, unfortunately, the IBM PC main board but the IBM PC XT main board. And uh, that came out about two years later. Uh, but the whole thing is very very similar and uh, the main difference is that the, this one can ha handle 256k byte of RAM and also uh, this one does not have a cassette interface at the back of the machine. Also you can see now we have 8 slots because uh, the original IBM PC had only 5 and that was very limited. This one comes now with a floppy drive as standard. Apart from that there's no real difference between the IBM uh, PC and the, this machine here. We have the main CPU under here which we cannot see and uh, then we have a few other chips. We have an 8255 up here and uh, this chip here is uh, an I.O. chip and uh, this machine doesn't really have any I.O. Uh, in itself but this chip as far as I know is used to control uh, stuff like the beeper, the loudspeaker that sits down in this corner here and um, also it uh, switches on and off different uh, stuff on the main board itself uh, but it's not really used for external stuff. And underneath there we have uh, an 8237 which is the direct memory access controller and uh, using this chip you could uh, stream data in and out uh, from your hard disk into the main memory while you're loading programs or loading data while the CPU is still running and doing other things. Uh, then we have a little chip here 8253 which is a, a programmable timer chip and uh, that is used to generate different clock signals uh, throughout the system. Uh, most important is the main clock which is uh, 18 point something weird milliseconds and uh, this weird clock chip is called a tick and is used even today on uh, all Windows machines. So this weird clock thing it goes back all the way to 1981. Below that we have an interrupt controller and uh, this takes care of uh, interrupts. An interrupt is basically something that uh, stops the CPU in what it's doing then runs a little bit of software to handle something urgent and then the main program can go back and run again. And uh, each of these slots here has uh, interrupt inputs. So you could, um, for instance, have a sound card and whenever the sound card had some data from the microphone, for instance, that it want to send to the main memory, it could do an interrupt. Um, what else have we got? We have a lot of glue logic. We have a lot of botch wires. So um, this board is uh, one of the very first IBM XT's. They actually went to production with these botch wires there. So uh, yeah, IBM is not better than anybody else. Then we have a little chip out here, the 8284, which is uh, a clock chip. And finally, we have a chip here, which is an NEC 8515. And that is the keyboard controller. We have the keyboard connector just, just next to it down here. And uh, yeah, that's basically it for the main board. It's very, very similar to a lot of other machines during that period. And the main difference, I guess, between this machine and the uh, Apple II, which also had uh, plug-in slots, was that uh, this one was basically all uh, Intel design. So it has those extra chips, DMA controllers and stuff like that, that the Apple was uh, lacking. Um, but anyway, the clock speed was uh, 3.75 MHz, so it was not much better than uh, any of the other machines during that day. What made the difference was all the plug-in cards, of course. You had hard disk controllers, floppy disk controllers and a lot of other stuff uh, than the other machines didn't have. But yeah, as you can see, a very, very basic machine at a very, very high price. This exact machine here with a 10 megabyte hard disk drive, one floppy drive and one uh, color monitor cost 9,000 US dollars back then, which is basically equivalent to 18,000 US dollars today. So uh, yeah, it was a really expensive machine. Uh, if you compare it to some of the other home computers, I mean, this was ridiculously priced. But business people liked it. Together with the black and uh, white monitor, or should I say black and green, it was very, very popular uh, among accountants and stuff like that, that could run uh, spreadsheets. And also among other people, like myself, that ran uh, WordPerfect 5.1. But anyway, thank you for watching and see you again soon.